It's often said we're becoming a service economy. An estimated five times as many jobs in the United States provide services rather than goods. Our guest leads the union whose 2.1 million members provide many of those services. Mary Kay Henry, International President of the Service Employees International Union, the SEIU, is this week's leader on leadership. Knowing when to ask for help is critical when you're in a leadership position. It's getting the best out of people. It's the essence of leadership. Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. Welcome to Leaders on Leadership, here with a student audience on campus at the Wayne State University and Detroit Public Television, Midtown Detroit Studio. I'm Larry Phobes. Mary Kay Henry has joked that her success as a union organizer can be credited to her family experiences growing up in suburban Detroit. Thanks for being here, Mary Kay. Thank you, Larry. So how does growing up, your experiences growing up in Michigan help make you a good union organizer? Well, I'm from a family of 10 children. And when I experienced my brothers and sisters moving in unison with me, there was nothing that we could not make happen together as a group. Now, you went off and you did your degree at Michigan State yes. with an interesting mix of urban planning and labor relations. Mm -hmm. Are those just two unrelated subjects that you liked, or am I missing a linkage? Well, you know, I um, graduated from high school in 1975. And as a middle school student, I watched Detroit burn. And when I was watching Detroit burn, I thought, I want to do something that helps rebuild the city. So that's why I went to Michigan State because of urban policy planning. I thought I would learn how to help rebuild Detroit. And then I was uh, a lobbyist as a work study student. And I met women from the UAW that were in the state legislature trying to deal with reproductive health ha hazards on the assembly line. And I was just captivated by them. I thought, I want to be with women like that. So I then added the labor industrial relations degree, hoping that it would mean I'd get a job at the UAW, but no such luck. <laughs> now, your first job out of school was completely different. You were distributing food stamps to... Yes, to on the east side of Detroit in the Jeff Chalmers neighborhood. Okay. And I was working with the American Friends Service Committee, a community organization, because I thought it was my way in to maybe I'll meet somebody that I can work with to rebuild the city. And that's, uh, that was why I took that job. Then how did you make the transition into union work? Because I met Olga Madar, who was a vice president at the UAW, and she encouraged me to come work in the union movement. And every door that I knocked on in the Jeff Chalmers neighborhood, people said, I don't want food stamps, I want a good job. So it made me realize that maybe the way to rebuild our cities was by growing the labor movement and having people work in good jobs. It's kind of a trait that we see with a lot of the guests on the show. They'd rather, they'd rather go after the core problem mm -hmm. as opposed to treat the symptoms. Mm -hmm. For the business of, of SEIU, what's the core problems that you're trying to solve compared to the symptoms? Well, we think the number one problem that we have to be a part of helping this nation solve is income inequality. And it's, been, it's now the worst that it's been since the Great Depression. And so our union is committed to making sure we reach out to as many non-union workers as possible. Because when 30% of the workers in this country were able to collectively bargain, wages were rising for everybody. And now they're not. And now they're not. Now, another trend we've seen uh, from leaders on the show, especially the, uh, certainly the uh, labor leaders, they all had started out their careers working in jobs that were represented by the union that they're now part of. Mm -hmm. You came in, you've been a staffer. Yeah. if you will, your whole career. How's that change your leadership viewpoint? 
Well, I, one of the reasons SEIU hired me as a staff person was because I had worked as a surgical tech at a hospital as a way to get through high school and in between college summers. So there, there was a sense at SEIU that I would at least have a, a frontline understanding of what our hospital members had been through. I was just going to add that when I was waiting to hear from SEIU about whether I had a job, I worked as a secretary in a hotel and I was fired for trying to form a union there. So I've had both experiences. Now about two years, almost exactly two years ago, your predecessor at SEIU, uh, chose Andy, to Stern. Andy Stern, chose to retire yes. halfway through the term. Yes. You were one of the several executive vice presidents at the time. Yes. And the presumed uh, successor was Anna Berger, who was the secretary treasurer. All of a sudden, your name started floating in the media as a, as a candidate. How'd that happen? Well, I um, learned from Andy that he was thinking about retiring. And I understood that he wanted Anna, our secretary treasurer, to serve. So I felt like I faced a choice, which was, could I offer a different vision and direction for the union, or could I be a member of her team? and go with her vision and direction. And I decided one day that I wanted to offer myself as an alternative choice uh, for the direction of SEIU. Some of the people who were championing you, some of the other uh, executive vice presidents, they were suggesting that they wanted you in the role so that you could refocus on organizing, need your organization to refocus on organizing, and to um, relink with some of the labor community who've been alienated. Organizing and unity seem like core tenets for uh, a labor organization. Mm -hmm. What was the misfocus that they were trying to move away from? Well, there were three reasons that I wanted to serve. One was to reprioritize private sector organizing, that we really had to redouble our efforts, and the other was to restore relationships across the labor movement because we had become pretty isolated as a union from the rest of labor. And the third was to reconnect with our members, that we felt like the union's national leadership had gotten um, too far apart from our members. And I don't think that there was necessarily that Anna didn't believe those things. I just think that I had the capacity to pull people together in a team uh, to help make it happen. Organizations of, of all types with all missions from all sectors get off point sometimes. Why do you think that happens? Um, Just in general for all. Well, I know that sometimes the external environment where there's increasing attack on worker organization that's happening throughout the U.S. now um, causes people to hunker down and to not think forward as much. So I think that's one characteristic. A second one is when there isn't enough new, new blood that enters the leadership circle I think the, there's, there ends up being a kind of groupthink where leaders are not challenged by differing opinions. And so those are the two things off the top of my head, Larry, that I can think of that I think create the conditions when organizations get stuck. Now, when, when leaders come into, uh, new leaders come into a position, they often come in either on the platform of dramatic change or stability. Where did you, which, which one of those did you come in on? What I tried to do was celebrate the incredible leadership that Andy had provided our organization because in 1996 we were a union of 800,000 workers and when he retired we were a union of 2.1 million members. And it took incredible visionary leadership on his part to help make that happen. And frankly, Anna Berger's partnership also made a huge contribution to our union. She is credited with breaking open our political action program and getting our union to focus on getting 300,000 of our members to contribute. So I wanted to celebrate their leadership contribution to the union and build on the wonderful things our organization had done, but try and meet this economic and political moment for working people. This whole process where she was presumed successor and then your name came was like a, like a media frenzy. It was all over the press. I paid no attention to it whatsoever. <laughs> I'm still a little unclear what happened in those three weeks. Yeah, Because I was talking to 77 of our leaders who were going to make the choice. And in many cases, I went and talked to our local union executive boards. I think I flew into 15 different cities in 10 days 
to have a conversation with our members about the future of the union. But for those of us on the outside, yeah, it, it was you all, were it was, watching it. Watching it the, do you think? Do you think the public in general perceives that as an organization in crisis, going through tough times, or do they just see that as a vital organization asking itself tough questions about its future and? and then moving. Well, I was just in St. Louis with a group of community leaders, our brand new hospital workers that formed a union there, and their view was that it was a healthy democratic process where there was no harm done and people evaluated the choice, made a decision, and then what I'm really proud of is that the union came together with a new level of unity that we haven't had in a long time. When all kinds of all large organizations have internal politics and they have personalities to play and you read about them in the corporate tell-all books and political insiders and all that stuff I don't remember how does it differ if you're a member driven a member organization mm -hmm. as opposed to a company full of employees well I think that um, our, our rank and file members our member leaders of local union executive boards um, experienced it as I have a choice and I have a responsibility as a leader to decide which leader at the na of the national organization is going to take the path that I want to follow. So I think people experienced it as a wonderful opportunity to experience the best of the trade union movement where African American, immigrant, Asian Pacific, women, men, all kinds of workers come together um, and have a uh, agreements and disagreements and debate and then achieve a, a unified solution. And so I think inside our organization, people experienced it as a, a test of how vital and healthy we are. Now, you were described as a consensus candidate in this process. Um, and then you told the executive board, I read someplace, that your vision was that the national union should be driven by the locals and the divisions, not the other way around. How do you then, as the leader of the organization, help come up with a vision that takes care of the unknown future for the organization, which may or may not be driven by current local issues, and come up with a vision that's not lowest common denominator? Mm. How do you do that? I think it's through a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, small groups, it's empowering other members of the officer team to go have conversations separate from me. We use um, a lot of technology where we are doing surveys and evaluations after every board meeting and before. So I would say it's a kind of multi-pronged communications approach and we listen to people outside of our organization. I did a tour of the rest of the American labor movement in my first 30 days and said, what has made you angry about our union's behavior? What would you like me to change that would deepen the work that you and I could do together on behalf of working people? And as you can imagine, from your face, Larry, people were like, whoa, what is she, you know? It was, so it was kind of getting out of the box of what people expected and going into overdrive, I think, in terms of listening to a lot of different voices. But then there have been other times when I will ask the board to adopt a proposal that I want to make that has had no sort of internal process whatsoever. Uh, so I think you have to be able to do both things. Thanks for being here, Mary Kay. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll talk more with Mary Kay Henry about leading the Service Employees International Union. Welcome back to Leaders on Leadership. Joining us today is Mary Kay Henry, International President of the Service Employees International Union, and we're talking about leading a labor union in today's fast-changing global economy. Before we talk about your presidency, give us a uh, thumbnail sketch of what is uh, the SEIU, what its aspirations are, and how you go about achieving them. 
Uh, we are a collection of nursing home workers, hospital workers, and home care workers who are dedicated to transforming the healthcare industry into a 21st century industry where we can control costs and provide as much health care as possible to everybody in this country. Uh, there's a million health care workers, a million public service workers who are very interested in working with state and local government about how to make government more effective uh, for all in this country. And then there are 300,000 property services and security officer workers. They are the um, shoulders on which the rest of us stand. They built our union as immigrant janitors in the south side of Chicago in 1920 when they formed together in spite of everybody saying, these aren't real workers, they just are servants. And um, they built a, a powerhouse of a union. And our mission is to fight for a more just and humane society for all. You, you talked in the first half about the successes that your predecessor had, growing the, uh, growing the membership, Double, more than double, uh, strong political activist, had the ear of the president on, on, on labor issues. But his, his leadership style was often described as effective but divisive. Compare your leadership style to him. I don't agree with that characterization of his leadership style. I thought he was incredibly uh, effective. And people who characterized him as de decisive, I think, were, were missing the point where he was trying to provoke the American labor movement into understanding that we have to confront the deepest income inequality of our time. And so I think his provocative nature um, helped shake things up in a way that made it possible for us to organize a million workers, get 300,000 of our members active in political action. And what I did want to do was um, take the leadership of SEIU and become a more equal partner uh, in the American labor movement. So in that way, Larry, I think I did choose a different path than the one Andy's been leading, was leading on. Now, uh, around Detroit, we've all seen pictures of when, in the early days when labor is organizing, uh, primarily UAW in this town, and there was physical conflict, very tough times on both sides of the, both sides of the equation. How has the labor management relationship changed and what has it become in today's world of mm. global economies and networking and 24-7? Well, it's a tale of two relationships, in my mind. In the places where we have historical collective bargaining, New York City, uh, San Francisco, LA, in our industry, I think Detroit for the auto industry, there is a deep partnership between labor and management about how to make a more effective, in our case, healthcare service, in the case of auto cars, um, but in the rest of the American economy, we are in a pitched battle with employers who do not want unions to exist in this, this, this country. So there are two different versions of sort of labor management relationships um, that I think we have to reconcile as a nation. Because I don't believe we can change the, the growing inequality of wealth in this country and the rising poverty unless we uh, are able to revitalize the American labor movement. I, I looked on your uh, biography on the, on, on the website, and, you, and one of the paragraphs you listed some major accomplishments, and you talked about ch reducing government inefficiency, improving health care, um, several things like that. There was only one accomplishment you listed that was traditional, more jobs, better pay. Mm. What's, what, what's the vision for success as a leader in a labor union today? Mm. I think the vision has to be about how are we improving uh, the country and that the labor movement needs to see its core mission as restoring equality in our economy and um, participation in our democracy. And that if we can't make those two things happen, we can't do our traditional mission of improving wages and hours and working conditions for working people. One of the words that gets associated with labor unions all the time is unity, a very traditional word. One of the words that gets associated with leadership all the time is change. How do you lead a labor organization to change so that it's current and relevant mm. with the changing times and keep the organization unified? Mm. Well, I think the key ingredient for success is unleashing the hearts and minds of our members because our members face change every day on the job 
or in their families, where the stress on working people in this country, I think, is so incredible that I celebrate every day what our members are making happen in spite of budget cuts, in spite of layoffs, in spite of unemployment. And I think about the change that they drive and getting them uh, in a position to lead on a broader scale is a key ingredient. And then the second thing is that the labor movement needs to exercise humility in relationship to the civil rights movement, the environmental movement, and other parts of what I call the justice movement. And we need to fuse together our institutional interests on behalf of the whole country. Do you think the challenge is different if you're leading a corporation or a government agency as opposed to leading a labor union? I don't think so. From the conversations I've had with the best of corporate leadership that I have relationships with, the New York League of Hospitals, the state of Oregon, the state of Colorado, the uh, hospitals in California, uh, we will often joke to each other that this point you made about change and unity exists in their institutions as well. At, at the end of the day, you're seeing the missions are different, but the job of leading a labor organization, the job of leading a uh, corporation or a government agency, there's some overlap there? Yes. Yeah. But the thing I have to tell you, Larry, that I think is a huge new ingredient in this moment is that the level of uh, collapse in, my, in the labor movement that is occurring, we lost a million union jobs last year throughout the economy, means that you, as a leader, you have to be willing to play defense and drive an offense simultaneously which I think is the challenge of leadership across the country at the moment. Now, um, one of the things I, I read about you that, that, that fascinated me was, on, again, on, on your, in your biography. We often think about leaders as having the responsibility to help develop the people that they lead in their organization. In your biography, you said do you believe the members of the union have developed your leadership? Oh, absolutely. How does it work both ways? Well, I've just had the privilege of witnessing a certified nursing assistant in a nursing home look her nursing supervisor in the eye and talk about how she thinks that staffing could be done better so that the residents get a bath every day, as an example. And when the nursing supervisor listened to the CNA and changed staffing, it transformed this woman's leadership in her family, in her community, and in her workplace. And so uh, those are the kinds of experiences that have taught me that I have to act with the courage of my convictions each and every moment, and uh, magic can happen when I do. I've got one last question, Mary Kay. You see, one of your uh, subjects in college was urban planning. Let's assume you wake up tomorrow morning, just hypothetically, and instead of being the head of SEIU, you're the mayor of one of the large oh. American cities mm -hmm. trying to rebuild itself uh, and get through this economic crisis. What, what mayors are forced to do and what they usually look at is maybe we need less people on the payroll, maybe we need to renegotiate the contracts. If you were mayor, how would you get through that problem? I would try and build a uh, unified force between business the rest of government and uh, the neighborhoods about how we were going to reinvest in the city and help people create a future that we paint together about what could be possible if we made a decision to reinvest and do real economic development that could be sustained in our inner cities. Thanks for being here, Mary Kay. Please join us again next time for another edition of Leaders on Leadership. See you then.
Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. An encore presentation of Leaders on Leadership is available online for viewing at dptv.org.